We're calling this meeting to order. Today is <clears throat> September 13th, 2021. This is our regular monthly board meeting. I'd like to welcome everyone that has uh, come out tonight and uh, welcome all of those that are watching this uh, via satellite. Uh, we welcome uh, the opportunity to, to share these meetings with, with the citizens of the county. So uh, we welcome everybody and uh, we're going to go ahead as always and start our meeting off with a prayer and pledge. And uh, Commissioner Ellis will be leading us off with a prayer and Commissioner Vaughn will leave us up with a pledge. Let's pray. Father, I'd just like to take time out of our day to say thank you for being our Lord and Savior. Thank you for always being there for us when we need you. Thank you for always being there and being our Lord. I'd like to ask for your guidance as we plan and organize and discuss county matters. We'd like to ask uh, your blessings on uh, our thoughts and our actions as we go through that. We'd also like to ask for state and federal uh, support. We just need to pray for our country. We need to pray for our state. And we're asking for blessings on our county. We ask these in your name. Amen. 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 Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can I hear a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. <clears throat> Your discussion? Those, that also includes the uh, closed session minutes, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, it will. Other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Any vote? Okay, now I need an approval on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to have one item added. That would be a discussion about the uh, American Relief Rescue Funds. Okay, uh, what, what's your pleasure for it? Any motion? I'll say, I'll, okay. Do we make a motion? Yes, sir. I'll okay. second that. Okay. I'd also uh, like to have something added. Do we need to vote on that? Yeah, one? let's do this okay. first. Uh, American Relief Fund. We'll put that under item F, Madam Clerk, under new business. All the favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. I'd also like to add a resolution about uh, declaring September the preparedness month for McDowell County. Second. A motion second. Any discussion? <clears throat> All the favor say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. That will be item G under new business. Okay, our first appointment tonight uh, is, uh, as always, a uh, COVID. Uh, 19 update. We have uh, Mr. William Keller here with us to give us that update. William, if you'll come on up to the podium. We welcome you tonight. Appreciate that. Good uh, evening to you. Appreciate you allowing me to provide another update on COVID 19. Uh, the current situation as of 3 p.m. today, we released 139 new positives, taking us to 7,458. 97 total deaths of McDowell County citizens due to COVID 19, uh, which was uh, an increase of two additional deaths from over the weekend. We have 231 tests pending. Our 14 day positivity rate is at 28%. We have seen this slightly decline due to the increase in testing that we have seen and a slight decline in the number of positives over the last 10 days. Uh, we are averaging 1,500 to 2,000 tests being performed weekly. Uh, the last three weeks we have seen over 400 new COVID-19 cases in McDowell. That is a record, uh, even surpassed what we saw back during the holiday season or post-holiday. August was a record month with 1,318 new positives. Prior record was in December of 2020 when we had 1,280. So far in the month of December, uh, we have logged 765 positives. So we're on track to have another record month unless we see this uh, decelerate. 
record number of positives last week in the 0 to 17 age group. Uh, all other age groups showed a slight decline, which was encouraging. We are about five days away from seeing or uh, realizing the effects of the Labor Day weekend. When we look back historically since this pandemic began, on average, it takes about 18 days for us to peak from a post-holiday surge, so we are approaching that. It's something we continue to monitor closely. If another concern is we do have cold weather coming, and from our numbers, if you look at our statistics from last year, we know towards the end of September we started trending upward uh, from where we were at. We had uh, declined the week of uh, September 18th last year, and then from the end of September until the end of January, we started that gradual climb upwards, and then we have the explosion of growth after Thanksgiving and Christmas. If we see an, an increase or a steady trend from where we're at now, uh, we've got some serious uh, times ahead from a hospitalization capa or hospital capacity standpoint and healthcare resource standpoint. And this is something that we continue to monitor really close. Talking about the operations section at the Mercy Operations Center, which remains activated under the state of Mercy, our healthcare resources are strained like never before. In my 23 years experience at, at EMS, I have never seen the situation as critical as it is from a unit availability standpoint, from a staffing availability standpoint, and the acuity of patients that have COVID-19. We still have our normal volume and normal occurrences of medical and trauma incidents that are continuing to occur on a daily basis. But the COVID patients stacked on top of this normal volume is putting an extreme workload on EMS, our first responders, as well as our hospital system. We're in, we're in a dangerous position. And anybody that tells you otherwise is not on the front line of this pandemic. We're in a dangerous position because the situation and the strained resources affects everyone regardless of whether you have COVID-19 or not. If you are sick from another ailment, and need emergency medical care or hospitalization, resources are strained. Last week, on five different occasions, five different days, McDowell Hospital requested ambulances divert from their facility. We honored, honored partial diversions, meaning that we could not honor full diversions and send every ambulance that received a call out of county. Doing so put, would put the citizens and visitors of this county in serious jeopardy if we honored a full diversion. There's simply not enough resources to do that or you jeopardize having all of your ambulances out of county and no one to answer in county calls. Outside of a pandemic, mutual aid is what we use to combat this type of situation. Sadly, our neighbors are facing the same issue. Rutherford Hospital has been on diversion for weeks. And we have countered different types of diversions at different facilities along with McDowell declaring the diversion. We're currently in a diversion status right now and my team is continuing to manage that uh, this afternoon as we ran out of ambulances three times already today. The administrators have been on ambulances. We are all hands on deck trying to manage the medical surge that is occurring due to this pandemic. So what is it? It is people that are 5, 10, 15 days post diagnosis of COVID experiencing uh, complications the majority of the time from COVID-19 pneumonia causing them severe respiratory distress required BiPAP or ven ven uh, mechanical ventilation and the vast majority of what we are seeing are unvaccinated individuals. From a staffing standpoint, the staff is, I've never seen the exhaustion and the fatigue like I see on healthcare providers' faces, and that's a frontline fact. We need the public's help, and we need it fast. We are going in the wrong direction, and winter is coming. Historically, winter is the busiest month for us, for a, from, or busiest season for us, from a respiratory standpoint, pneumonia, flu, and other type of ailments that occur during the winter months. We can't continue on the path because we don't have the resources to sustain this type of growth 
in emergency medical calls for service and hospitalizations. I, along with the staff, is appreciative of the crisis pay that has been established for emergency services divisions to fill additional vacancies and additional shifts as we surged three additional ambulances and five quick response vehicles earlier today to keep up with the volume and try to manage the diversion with McDowell Hospital. We've discontinued our public relations events, our standby at football games, simply because we don't have the staffing to do it and they're needed to respond to emergency calls. We are doing virtual hospitalization referrals to the atrium system to try to prevent transports to the emergency department for stable COVID-19 patients that meet the criteria under our protocol. This looks like enrolling them in a virtual hospital. This uh, will allow them to be seen on a daily basis by a provider, receive a pulse oximetry, receive home oxygen. All of that is coordinated through the atrium hospital system, but it's another way to try to help decompress the emergency room status. System-induced ref, uh, refusals to where we get to a point where we uh, actually do the refusal to treat and release. Alternative destinations, historically ambulances only transport to the hospital emergency department. Under the public health emergency waiver, there is the option for us to transport to alternative destinations, and that is part of our surge plan. Currently in the process of reaching out to additional part-time personnel to hire EMT basics to to split paramedic crews to allow additional ambulances to surge in the system. From the planning section at the EOC, we are working on the booster and the third dose planning as we await federal guidance on what the third uh, shot is going to look like. They're continuing to work very closely with the hospital on medical surge planning for the upcoming winter months. From the logistics section, we are starting to see supply chain issues with common medical supplies used on a daily basis by EMS paramedics. Our logist logistics division is trying to adequately forecast out what could potentially be needed by EMS paramedics through the month of March and get these orders placed and try to get this, the, uh, the supply chain or sources from different suppliers as we see the supply chain tighten. From the finance section of the EOC, we have 17 FEMA applications that have been filed for reimbursement for this incident. For anyone listening at home or in this audience, one hurricane is normally one application. We have 17 applications just in this rural county. That's literally the workload from a finance standpoint, it's 17 hurricanes. Uh, that should hopefully paint the picture of what all was involved in managing this incident. From the public information standpoint, uh, we continue to push out the message of vaccinations, of free COVID-19 testing, and in conjunction with the health department advertising these clinics, as well as the uh, testing drive-throughs in an effort to uh, keep the public informed. And we continue to push the message, vaccinations do work. Yes, there are breakthrough infections, they weren't designed to be 100%, keep you 100% from getting the virus. You can still have a breakthrough infection. The rate is low, but the vaccines are doing their job to prevent serious illness and hospitalizations. And that's the message we're trying to drive home. What we are in is avoidable. And the direction we take in the next six to eight weeks is gonna determine how we fare during the winter months. And we hope people listen to this message we're calling this frontline facts. We are hitting this dead center, but we need people's help and we need it now. And I'm happy to take any questions. We have all three uh, shots available here in the county. That is correct. And it's at the health center. That is correct. Uh, we are, uh, I'm not sure I wrote it down, but I'm not sure that I got it in this paper. Uh, June, July, we saw uh, vaccination rate fall off pretty substantially. The month of August, we were over 1,200 vaccines that were, or 1,200 first doses that were administered, which was a significant uptake. I think there's two drivers of that. One, you had the uh, cash incentive that was being offered, but you also had um, the Delta variant that was uh, on a rampage. And we talked to a number of people that came through the clinic and said the variant scared them, and they were 
uh, there to be vaccinated. And a lot of people were unaware that they actually got received a gift card there at that time. William, what can we do to help you? I mean, what, from our position as a board, what do we need to do to help uh, aid the good fight? We know, number one, we need to encourage people to get the vaccine. We're with you on that. It's a matter of life or death. We said that in this room before. Uh, we're seeing younger people affected by this, correct? According to your data, the zero to 17 age group it, it tested the highest they've had for positives and everybody else is declining in other age groups. So what do we need to be doing apart from messaging to help you out? The main, uh, the main objective right now is we've got to get the transmission levels down in this community. The hospitalizations that we are seeing right now are primarily driven from the end of August, people that tested positive from the end of August and the first week of September. So we still, if we continue stacking 400 plus positives a week, this hospitalization issue is not going to go away. So stopping community transmission. If people are sick, stay home. If you are positive for COVID-19, don't be circulating in the public if it's during your quarantine period. Go back to the basic three W's. None of us like wearing a mask. A mask works. If a mask didn't work, EMS employees wouldn't be running calls today. I mean, our employees are in mask 18 and 20 hours a day. I don't have um, people that complain about masks for 15 minutes. It's hard for me to understand it when I've got employees 18 and 20 hours a day in mask. We've got to have help. Healthcare providers cannot dig out of this alone. And these are, once again, we're labeling this frontline facts because we are the ones in the trenches seeing this. And this is immense. We get an email once a week from your rep. Hospitals showing how many people are in the ICU that are vaccinated versus unvaccinated and how many are on ventilators that are vaccinated versus unvaccinated. So I've not seen a bit of any data that states that people who get the shot first or second and or booster uh, are being admitted to the hospital because of effects from a shot. But we're seeing tremendous data, as you stated, that the people who are feeling the ICU and are on ventilators are unvaccinated people. That's probably 99 percent of them are unvaccinated people. Most we get that each week. Most of the time, the vaccinated individuals that are hospitalized who have COVID, there's substantial or medical history, pre-existing conditions, immunocompromised patients, transplant patients, people that start off with a compromised immune system. And yes, that does occur, but it's a very small percentage of what we're seeing. I read an article the other day, uh, and it was supposed to be fact, that uh, there was, I think, well over uh, a couple hundred million vaccines have been given out nationwide and uh, uh, out of that you know a lot of people have this thought process that uh, the vaccines have killed people but out of that number that i read there was only three reported deaths that were contributed to uh, uh, an allergic reaction to the vaccine uh, so and there you would encourage somebody to check with their their doctor wouldn't you absolutely and they got i can, got I can tell you deaths. we've administered over forty thousand shots in McDowell and we have not administered epinephrine for an allergic reaction at any of our clinics. But that was a nationwide number, or I mean a worldwide number. Excuse me. But anyway, if if there's anything we can do, William, uh, you know, we, we certainly can do encourage people to, to get the vaccine. You know, it's, a, it's one of those things you can't force them to, I guess, but to, uh, I certainly encourage them to get the vaccine. It's, so important that we do, and that's the only uh, real combat we have to this disease. You know, is, is to get vaccinated. Do you have any other proposals as far as the? Uh, I know that you came up with critical pay, which I do think helping, but it still it sounds that you're very, very overloaded. Uh, do you have any other proposals using? first responders or any anybody else to help assist in lowering some of the stress on some of your people yeah that's uh, actually what we're working through 
as early as today, uh, bringing in additional part-time personnel who have signed up. Where we get into trouble is the ability to staff the hospital, the ability to staff with nurses. For us, the ability to staff with paramedics. That's where we start to get strained because there's simply uh, not that staffing pool to pull from. And you have people that are uh, exhausted. They're burned. And the course we're on is not sustainable. That's why I'm pleading with people. And I think people, until they see it, until they see their loved one pouring the sweat, gasping for air, trying to breathe against a BiPAP or a ventilator, surely it doesn't have to get to that point until people take this serious. It can be prevented. This is it. preventable. This is totally provoking. Any new information on pages 12 and under yet that you're hearing? So the latest information on the Pfizer vaccine is it looks like that decision could potentially come towards the end of October, the 1st of November. But as far as how that decision is going to come down, I've seen no information. I just know how we can help you. Out of our 97 deaths, do you know how many have been vaccinated? I do not know that number. I know the health department, uh, and we can certainly try to get that, get that number for you. Any questions? Um, I appreciate everything y'all are doing. The strain that your body is undergoing, trying to take care of a county that's part of or not listening. Thank, Thank you. you very much, William. Next on the performance, <clears throat> tonight's performance is item B, a uh, transit update uh, in a public area. Mr. Jason Hollifield, we welcome you, Jason. Thank you very much. Just briefly in the way of uh, an update since our last uh, meeting. Uh, at long last, uh, we do have three vans that are in Charlotte at the uh, bus dealer. They're being final prep to get them to us, hopefully Thursday or Friday. When a van is delivered from the factory, it's not DOT ready, so that's part of the contract with the bus dealers. They put finishing touches on it. So when we get it, we do our inspection and it's ready to go. Uh, I don't see any reason why those vans will not be on the road this time next week. Um, we do have three new drivers in the pipeline that will be finishing training Wednesday, so we should have them on the road by Thursday. So with the new vans and the new drivers, this will not quite get us where we need to be, but obviously it's much closer than where we are now. Um, as far as vans, uh, we did place an order Thursday for uh, four additional vans uh, that were, uh, uh, the, the funding for those were uh, was approved a year ago. We just got one now with Raleigh where we were ready to order. Hopefully, we're hearing we'll see those in six months. So with the one that we just got, the three that we have coming, and the four that we were ordered, um, within a year from now, six months to a year, we should be in, in good shape van-wise. That will leave us with only one old van at that point, which will be replaced as soon as possible. So I'm feeling really encouraged about the way we're going with the vans and the drivers. Um, just as far as numbers, in August we provided uh, 1,655 trips. Um, Approximately 20 of those were for vaccine appointments. The federal money that we do have available for vaccines, they have now amended that, so we can also use that for transporting people to COVID testing or to a doctor's appointment um, for COVID-related issues. So hopefully that will that will help somewhat uh, with the issues that we're facing. And as far as um, Updates, that's really all I have in the way of uh, updates. If you have any questions about any of those. Mr. Wood, would you like to do a follow-up and uh, give us any requests for your staff? Just be really brief. Jason is doing a great job. He's a great staff and he's uh, getting us to work. Like you said, we're, we're getting close to where we need to be. So, um, great endorsement. He does have um, Two action items, a couple of uh, one plan, and then a hearing, and then uh, 
this funding plan for fiscal year fiscal year 23 to take care of. So we need to go in to a public hearing. You have a plan first, is that right? <coughs> as far as the um, funding request, the the section. I forget which one. Yes, thank you for reminding me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. I was so focused on the other. Yes, as far as our excuse me, our proficiency review, which was held in June, the last piece of that puzzle is the Title VI plan, which unfortunately we didn't realize until that review that the county transit department didn't have one. So we submitted that to the Office of Civil Rights um, in June for review. They finally approved that uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I do have that uh, before you tonight for uh, approval. This is the Title VI uh, uh, non-discrimination policies that, that we follow. Mr. Chair, make a motion we approve the uh, policies. Second. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So now the hearing for the funding. Do we need to now go into a public hearing? Yes, sir. Uh, I'll declare us in a public hearing setting at this time and uh, proceed with that. Thank you very much. Uh, this is for the fiscal year 2023 numbers. Um, the first amount is broken down into two categories, our administrative costs and our capital costs. Uh, this year the budget, the total amount for the administrative uh, 174904 The total amount for the capital is one hundred four and sixty three dollars one hundred and one hundred four thousand sixty three for the capital. Um, the as in years past, we are being told uh, that the amount I present to you represents the state and uh, local share. As the state amount has not been approved yet, I will give you those breakdowns now. The uh, for the administrative grant, the uh, total share would be thirty four thousand nine hundred eighty. For the capital, it would be 20812 which would be a total of 55792 um, Provided that the state funds are there, the local share would be 36641 But as I said, um, per grant instructions, um, we are told to prepare for the state and local amount in the event the state amount is, is not funded. And if there's any questions as far as how we have those funds allocated in either category, I'll be happy to answer that. So basically, Jason, we get we we uh, spend fifty five seven ninety two to get two hundred seventy eight thousand directly. Correct. And if the uh, knock on wood, the state amount is there, the county amount would actually be thirty six thousand six hundred forty one. That amount, I will say this: that capital amount does include funding for one van, as I mentioned earlier. With the bands that we have in the pipeline, we will have one old van left. Uh, there is money in the 104 to replace that van. So at that point, the county would have no vehicle older than a 2018 model. And this is for July next year? July of 2023? July of 2023? Correct. July of 22 July 22 through 23. Correct. So June 30, 23. They, they stay a, a little bit ahead of us. But, right. Uh, so not current, but the next fiscal. Correct. Okay. You comment. Okay. Make a motion to. Uh, oh. We yeah. have to go out of. Yeah. Oh. Here. But I hear a motion that we uh, go out of this period. Was there anybody in the public we should yeah. speak to? Uh, nobody okay. said anything. Any other questions, comments? So move. Say. Motion say. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. I'd like to make a motion uh, as presented up to uh, about thousand seven ninety two uh, as presented uh, to go with this uh, transit. Second. Got a motion to second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hallfield. Thank you for your time. Next on the agenda under item C is the land use plan overview. We've got Ms. Carol Fuller uh, 
the FRC and uh, Ron Harmon here tonight. So, uh, Ms. Fuller, you come to the podium, please. There she is. Hello. Um, did you put this as an uh, attachment or is it a I think it's, presentation? Is it both? Is it in here as well? It's in here as well. Okay. And it, um, it's also going to be the website. Okay. It's on the um, side. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about the McDowell County Land Use Plan um, and what we're proposing to do. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you probably want to know why we're proposing to do uh, our land use plan. Um, in 2019, the state legislature voted um, and consolidated and streamlined the zoning um, ordinances across the state. They used to be in two, if you were a county or if you were a municipality, they were in two different sections of the statute. They consolidated those sections into what's known as colloquially as 160D. There, you guys did some ordinance updates um, that I'm and I, I didn't even introduce myself. I'm Carol Fuller, and I'm from the um, Foothills Regional Commission. And last year we did, um, as part of this 160B update, we did an ordinance review of the zoning ordinance and made some changes based on that, um, on this, this state statute. Because that had to be done by July 1st of, of this year. Well, the, another change, besides the ordinance changes, um, is that if you have zoning, you have to have a reasonably updated land use plan or comp plan. And the School of Government has given us some guidance in what they consider reasonably updated. If you are in an area that is not growing in a, a very fast clip, 10, 10 years is probably reasonably updated. If you're in a fast growing area, um, five years is probably be better. Um, and as far as I can tell, that your land use plan dates back um, to the 1990s and has been readopted. So it was, was our thought that we needed to update that land use plan so that it, um, it meets the state statute requirement and that you'll still be able to enforce the zoning that you do have um, on July 1st of next year because the deadline to have this reasonably updated plan is July 1st and there is no real um, grace period. They've already given us grace period because all of this was supposed to have been in effect actually in July, but because of COVID-19, they extended the deadline um, to, out to July 1st of 2022. So um, the school of government also, knowing that there are more than 500 municipalities and 100 counties, knew that there would be a, a several a large section of the state that would need help doing land use plans. And they had developed a process called Plan NC, um, which we'll be using to, to do this. And it has uh, seven steps um, to get to that land use plan. And it is summarize the existing conditions, engage the community, set some goals and policies, map the future, identify implementation strategies, draft and adopt the plan, and move to action. Well, that's pretty much my plan is to follow these steps in um, some form or fashion um, and what we'll end up with is a land use plan with a few goals and objectives and um, a good summary of the existing conditions and the future land use plan which is um, one of the big pieces that come out of this. If you have questions please let me know. I'm just going to keep moving through the timeline. We have 10 months. We're in September. We're going to try and do some the demographics and some of the other uh, therapy outreach. We're uh, designing a survey right now. We're going to have an initial uh, planning board meeting and keep working our way down. And we hope to be the plan is to be back in front of you a couple of times. Anything that's in green um, is a meeting back here at the town council. We're, we're going to go over the survey results and make some goals and objectives hopefully around January. And then we'll release the draft um, in March and April and finalize the draft um, by the end of 
find the opportunity so that you guys can adopt it in time to meet the deadline. Um, that is the plan. I'm sorry that it says town council meeting down there. I'm also doing a plan for my retirement and I missed that. So initial demographics. This, um, I, I noted on here that you guys are going to talk about census 2020, so I may end up staying so I can talk about that too if you have any questions. But I pulled the population numbers um, from 1970 to 2020, and it did go down, but it's actually a relatively teeny tiny amount from 45,000 to, uh, to 44,996. Now, I would suspect that you guys probably felt that your town, your county grew in the 2010 to 2020 range. There is some ways um, to talk about that in the census later um, to see if you can make a change. But some other quick facts about the county. Um, median age is 43.9. Uh, the percent over 65 is 19.9. And the median household income is 43,646. Um, these are always fun for me. The percent of high school diploma or higher is 83.9 and the BA is 17.4, which is actually very typical for the Appalachian region, but North Carolina as a whole has almost doubled on the percent with a bachelor's degree or higher. So it does show some um, interesting demographics. We will supplement uh, this with quite a bit more demographics and some other data and inventory maps. The other the next step, which is uh, we're going to do four different things for public outreach. We're planning to do a survey, a uh, public workshop um, sometime in late winter, early spring, um, bringing the draft here, and then we need a public hearing as part of um, the plan's approval. So that'll be another option. Uh, and next step. So we're on steps one, or one and two right now. Um, we're developing history and geography and the demographics. We plan to go to the planning board next and uh, work on the survey, and then that will go out in October, hopefully, um, and be open for at least 30 days. And like I said, in December or January, we'll be back to talk about survey results and to um, get your guys' um, thoughts on goals and objectives. Are there questions, comments? Very important in this bill, I think. Um, I don't anticipate it will be a large document, like uh, probably 40 to 60 pages, but it should have some uh, good statistics in it and some goals and objectives for grant applications and your future land use map. So we will have a good plan to take, take forward for the next 10 years or more. Yeah. Thank you. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you for being with us. Next on the agenda, under appointments, is item D. Mr. Whalen Prigor from the Senior Center is here to give us an update. We welcome Mr. Whalen. He and I got to do something that was really fun uh, not long ago. We got to go visit the oldest, possibly the oldest lady in the county. We had, that never was confirmed, I don't think, but it uh, was. No, it was confirmed, but, but she was a wonderful. 102 years old, that, that would be hard to beat. Yeah. And she was still very alert and uh, frisky was she was <laughs> she was she was and I, and I wanted to mention this is first of all I'd like to ask is anyone in here currently getting older? <laughs> David, not this room. Not this room. No, no, you guys are amazing. Somehow you perfected that. Well, in actuality, McDowell County is aging. As a population, we're just getting larger as an aging. So if we go back to 2000, uh, when she was showing the populations on there, uh, back in 2000, we had 6,009 6, individuals over the age of 65. 2010, 7,337. And in 2019, 9,831. So the interesting thing about that is the Division of Aging and Adult Services has actually projected out to 2039. And in 2039, McDowell County is projected to have 13,056 people age 65 and older. Well, that's a lot of data. What does that really mean? Well, what it means is right now, 
in McDowell County, your friends and neighbors, approximately over one in four is over the age of 65. And in 18 years, we can have one in three in this community. So we are an aging population. We might not be growing that much uh, in the numbers wise in the last 10 years, but we know that as a group, we are getting older. And that is a wonderful, wonderful thing to think about because not only are we getting older, we're aging longer. If I look at the population of 85 plus in our community, when I started here at the Senior Center about 18 years ago, we had less than 400 over the age of 85. Now we have over 1,000, and in 2039, we're looking at close to 2,000 in this community. So you folks can plan on a good long life. You do the right things, and that's where we come in at the Senior Center. I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we're doing. A lot of you may be familiar with the programs that we currently have, but I just want to tell you a little bit about us. So the biggest program and how we began was in April 1977. We started two feeding sites for seniors here in McDowell, two church fellowship halls. And at that time, um, we had a very small group, and we have grown over the years. And this last fiscal year, we served, wait for it, 26,994 meals. So we've grown just a little bit. But let me tell you about this last year. So we had a little something going on in our community, and William Keller told us about it that has affected everything about our lives at this point. So the McDowell Senior Center in mid-March of 2020, we shut down our dining rooms. But we didn't stop feeding people that came to our senior centers. We just changed the way that we did it. We started doing drive-through meals. And it started off, we would put together these shelf-stable meal boxes, and we'd give those out once a week. And then we started making our own frozen meals just kind of like TV dinners that we actually made on site ourselves. And that continued on to November. And in November, we actually started for a couple weeks doing hot meals again. Yay, everybody coming through is getting a hot meal there. Well, unfortunately, the numbers started spiking again. William showed us the data on that. We started doing frozen meals again. But in February, things started getting better. And we were able to start having hot meals again. And we've continued that up through today. In fact, today they were handing out meals at the Senior Center here in Marion, and also the AC Bud Hogan Community Center in Old Fort. So we've seen some wonderful positive changes during the difficult time of feeding people. Um, people are asking, why are no dining rooms open? Well, there was good reasons for that. We were just trying to prevent group spread of the COVID virus. And in July 1st, our numbers were so low that we reopened our dining rooms and people came to have lunches and it was wonderful. Everybody was missing that socialization. Unfortunately, that socialization led to a few weeks later, the health department contacting us and letting us know that we had an exposure. Unfortunately, we had a few people that ended up contracting COVID at one of our dining sites, in fact, one here in Marion. So we closed those back down again and we started welcoming people right back through the drive-through they come through, we wave at them, hand them a meal. Our staff is wearing masks, and we're back to that. Um, but it's been, it's been difficult for our seniors, especially when the senior center is closed. Socialization was the number one thing. The meal was part of it, but it was really spending that time together. So unfortunately, we can't do that right now. But what we are doing is we're doing the drive through meal service, and you're getting a little socialization from our staff each day. But in a moment, I'll tell you about some other ways that we're doing socialization. But the next thing I want to tell you about is our most important services, and that's our home lured meals program. A lot of people refer to it as Meals on Wheels, but the way that we receive funding from state, federal, and state funding, we call it Home Delivered Meals Program. This has been a real challenge for us the last year. We have fantastic, wonderful local volunteers here that deliver each day in McDowell, running all over the county. But during COVID, we lost a lot of those wonderful people. Um, not lost them. They determined they weren't going to deliver meals anymore. And so we've been actively pursuing new volunteers. And that's what we'd like to get that message out to anybody listening, is that there is no better way to spend an hour of your time than helping people out that are homebound seniors in our community, bringing them a hot meal each day and just that warm smile and that wave, just brightening their day just a little bit. So if there's anybody out there, or if you know anybody that may be interested, please have them contact the McDowell Senior Center. And to let you know, 
in the last fiscal year, we served 28,890 meals to those people. And what we'd like to do is increase our volunteers and be able to increase those numbers to serve more. Um, one thing people don't realize the McDowell Senior Center does is this. We actually provide funds for in-home aides to go into people's homes. Uh, that is one area that people are unaware of that we do at all. And so we'd like to get that message out there is that we're serving homebound seniors, uh, not just homebound seniors, I apologize, seniors that may have disabilities or other things that prevent them from doing their own housework or needing assistance taking a bath. Uh, we, uh, we provide funds for aides to go into those people's homes and help them with those services. And this last year we did 4,425 hours of aid services. The important thing about that is the cost of doing those services runs about between eighty dollars and $90,000 a year. If you compare the cost of putting one person in a nursing home, it's going to be equal or close to that. And you take the cost of two people, while well, this service provides services to about 40 people at a time. And that number fluctuates throughout the year, but that's what we maintain. Um, additionally, veteran services has been going on this entire time during COVID. In fact, from July through June, we have had over 1,800 client interactions this last year. Uh, we had Doug Gooch helping out with that program. He's retired, and now we have David Burt, who's doing an excellent job uh, helping out seniors with that. And one of my favorite things that I get to do is helping people understand Medicare. Does anybody in here completely understand Medicare? <laughs> Nobody does. Even the people that create <clears throat> Medicare and work for Medicare don't understand that very much. But I've had the pleasure for over 15 years helping Medicare beneficiaries in our county, looking, uh, understanding Medicare first off, and then looking for other insurances that can help them out. But more importantly, we help people that are at an income level where they can help lower the cost of their insurance programs and also lower, more importantly, the cost of their prescription drugs. And through that process, we also identify people that we send on to the Department of Social Services that may be eligible for more uh, additional health programs. And I talked about socialization earlier. I talked about how the dining rooms closed and we kind of lost some of that socialization. Well, to let people know, especially those out there that have been part of our program, especially new people in the area that may have not come out before, is that we have our classes and activities still going on. So if you want to come and do a craft class, if you want to paint a painting, if you want to play guard games, if you want to line dance, we have got tons of activities going on there, and those are available. Uh, the activities are available through our website, uh, through our newsletter each month, and that is at least one way we can keep that socialization in our community. But also, a couple other things. Legal aid is still going on, helping people prepare simple wills and power of attorneys at no charge. We also work with the Division of Death and Heart of Hearing to help people, uh, we do referrals to help people get a free hearing aid, a free telecoil hearing aid. Um, there are some financial factors, but those are pretty high, so about 95% of the people we talk to do qualify for that. In fact, you have all paid for those hearing aids. Do you know why? Every single month on your telephone bill is a charge that funds the North Carolina Deaf and Division, the Division of Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services telephone hearing aid program. So if you've already paid for those hearing aids, so why not go ahead and get one? Now, if you don't need it, don't get one. But definitely refer to people who do need it to us. Um, one thing that I want to talk about today is that there's a couple other programs that are not exactly through the Senior Center what we're helping refer people to is housing repair programs here in McDowell County. Uh, the first one I wanted to talk about was, let me see if I can look at it without my notes. No, I can't. So the first one is through Community Action Opportunities, and it's a weatherization program. Well, what does weatherization mean? Well, we know we have bad weather, but what, how does it help out? Well, this program can help with in installing installation in homes, installing smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors and ventilation fans, replacing older energy consuming refrigerators, air sealing homes and installing vapor barriers. And what's great about this program is for my population, 
That program prioritizes elderly and also disabled people among, uh, above other applicants to the program. And there's another great program through community action offerings called HARP. Now HARP stands for Heating and Air Repair and Replacement Program. It helps qualified persons repair or replace faulty, unsafe home heating systems, and in some cases can even provide a new heating system for people. Also, if people have certain health uh, situations and concerns, they may be qualified for the other side with cooling help and maybe getting a free cooling system installed. Um, What's the typical amount they do if somebody applies and they are awarded that? What's the typical amount that is awarded towards uh, replacing a heating system or an air system? That is a great question, David, and what I'll say to that is, is that if someone is interested in that, for them to contact me, okay. I'll contact the agency and get that information for them. Okay. Um, one other repair program that I want to talk about today is the Home Repair Partnership Program through the Gateway Foundation. They now have a local office here in McDowell County. And this program is to again assist the low income, the elderly, my population that I work with, and disabled people. And unlike the previous program with weatherization, they're looking at more common situations that occur, such as leaking roofs, leaky pipes, um, a hole in a floor, also helping with wheelchair ramps. Uh, that is a need. As our population does age up, and as people do have more disabilities, that is something important for people to get in and out of their homes safely. Now, what's really cool about the Gateway Foundation the Housing Repair Program Partnership is that they work with a lot of local churches here in the community that are already doing the work. And what they do there is that they work with the churches and then they leverage grant sources. Um, they also provide communication and community support for the renovation and repair of people's homes. So this is a great one. Uh, we have applications at our office for both of these programs to help out. But what we want, the whole purpose of the McDowell Senior Center and why it's been around is not only to offer nutrition services and help people socialize, but more importantly, what we want to do is keep people in their homes as long as possible, as long as they can safely do so. That has been the goal of what we do. And with that, there are so many topics beyond what I've talked about today that we provide information or referral for. So if you are an aging person here in McDowell County, and you have questions or concerns about something that uh, is important to you, just please contact, uh, contact us at the McDowell Senior Center and we'll help you with those uh, issues the best way that we can. We can't help with every single one, but we've helped out with a lot. Oh, um, one more thing I wanted to, well, not just one more thing. ARP Tax Credit, that actually went on successfully this year. They did over 700 tax returns for free for people here in McDowell County. Just wanted to mention that, and finally, my notes. William came up here and he really told us about the grave situation that we're in. And especially concerning for us is our senior population. And they are the ones that are suffering uh, the most hospitalizations. They are, the, unfortunately, the ones that are most passing away at this time. And William has told us, and you have all told us, the tools that we have to help us prevent this. But the one thing that I just want to remind people of is, as the search continues, you personally have that choice to not infect other people. And what I mean by that especially is this. If you have an aging parent, an aging neighbor, and you have been helping them during this time, that is absolutely fantastic. But if you yourself have been exposed or come into contact with them and have any fear, or you may have children that uh, may have been exposed, please don't come into the people's homes. Please don't spend that close time together without wearing a barrier or socially distancing. We have these very simple tools to keep our seniors safe. And at the beginning, we talked about how our populations just keep growing. And we know in 18 years it's going to be so much higher. But to maintain that growth, we need to keep everyone healthy and safe here in the community.
especially those that are aging now and aging up, those 85 plus year olds that want to be 95 year olds and 100 year olds, 102 year olds, 105 year olds, and that's something that we can do by interacting safely with our seniors. That's what I want to talk about tonight. Do you all have any questions? No, that's really good, buddy. The meals that are delivered uh, that you're using volunteers for, is that uh, all three uh, breakfast, lunch, supper, or what, what would that be? Patrick, that's a great question. That is just a lunch meal Monday through Friday. Okay. And while you know, you're on that topic, uh, I'd like to encourage everybody that is watching tonight, if you have some spare time and uh, on your hands, uh, the senior centers could certainly use the volunteers. So, You've got some extra time that you're wanting to utilize uh, in a good way. Go out and visit Whalen and Senior Center, and uh, uh, they've got lots of things you can do. And uh, helping get these meals out is a very important thing. The age group that you're working with, you do say seniors, but is that 55, 60, 62, 65? What you have the best questions tonight. So our target group is age 60 and above but our programming is for adults of any ages we do allow children to participate in some of our programs we talk to the class instructors beforehand to get their approval and make sure it's safe for them to do so but our senior center should also be considered a community center because we want everybody to enjoy it hearing aids that are <clears throat> provided is that again specifically for 60 and older it is not that, that is not, that is just an income basis. So if you have someone that has worked in a position in industry where they may have pretty significant hearing loss and they may be 30 years old, they can apply for that program too. In fact, if you do run at anybody at any age that's suffering from hearing issues, we need to get them connected to the Division of Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services. They have a wonderful office in Morganton and when things lighten up, uh, when things improve in our area, they'll be coming back on site to the Senior Center. Last question I've got is, uh, do you have a pamphlet or a letter or something that you send to churches for the repair, home repairs and stuff like that, or do you just work with churches that approach you? Okay, so for the homing, uh, housing repair pro program, Yes. Uh, so that's actually done through the Gateway Foundation. But what we are is kind of a conduit. We have the applications, we help people fill those out and get them back to the uh, Gateway Foundation, the Housing Partnership Office. And that's something we've been doing for the last few months now. Okay. Thanks so much. It uh, sounds very interesting what you're doing. Thanks so much. We have, a, we have a good time, and we want to continue with that, and we want to do it in a healthy way. You all have any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda, out of me, Broadband update. Uh, we have Brad Ayers here tonight to give us an update on that. Brad, if you will, come forward. Hi there, Mr. Chairman. My name is Brad Ayers. Uh, I'm the Southern Links uh, Senior Director for Government Affairs. And I have Bob Lilly, who is the Regional Vice President for this area. And uh, just wanted to give you a little background on our company here. Uh, Southern Link is um, a company that was acquired by Altice USA in 2016. Uh, and just recently this year, along with the same lines, uh, back in April, they acquired Morris Broadband. And then as part of the uh, uh, relationship now with Morris Broadband, uh, we are currently expanding out into this area. And uh, I'll give you a little update on that. But Bob, would you like to say a couple of words before we? Sure. Just uh, we're just happy to to be here. I've been with with Altice uh, since 2018, and so been in this area a couple times. And there's a lot of obviously uh, funding for broadband expansion to get into the rural counties and that type of thing. And we really just wanted to kind of, even though we're wearing masks, put faces with names. I uh, look forward to working with you guys as we do this transition. You guys certainly are welcome, dear. 
Well, I can tell you we're looking forward to the opportunity. And uh, I know for the uh, North Carolina Great Grant Program, and I know there's a lot of interest in that here, uh, I've got the latest uh, timelines for you and want to update you there. We've uh, <coughs> Uh, so construction wise where we're at is our fiber and our fiber nodes uh, have now been constructed and, and spliced and we've got two more power supplies to finish now this has been a little bit of a delay because we haven't been able the supply chains basically like a lot of things have been disrupted so we've been waiting on the components to arrive for that power supply uh, expecting though that that will be finished and we hope to have everyone turned on by October the 15th so that's the that's the key date here. We apologize for that delay, but you, you know it's not just uh, our company, uh, Altis and Optimum, trying to get these parts, but every other broadband company has those same needs. Uh, good news is we have actually walked out over 90 miles in the county here, looking at what your infrastructure needs are, and I can tell you right now that we're going to have an additional 984 homes that we're going to pass in the county, and that will be uh, just. It's great news for all of us. You know, it's a strong market for us to serve, and we're, we look forward to being able to offer uh, the folks here in the county that type of service. So that's kind of the latest we have for you there. Uh, I will keep all of you posted. Uh, I haven't met you before, but we're just uh, trying to make our way up to cover. Bob and I actually can both cover several states, so uh, wanted to be here and uh, and just fill you in on those numbers. So if there's any questions, uh, feel free to. Uh, uh, ask us and we'll do our best. We do have a question, Bob, on the uh, Brad, excuse me. Um, the 984 homes, uh, is that uh, in basically the district of where Morris used to be? Yes. Sir. And trying to make sure, it, what is the percentage? Do you know the percentage of the homes that do not have uh, broadband in that area? Um, is, is that going to open up? Is it going to be 90%? Is it going to be higher than that, lower than that? Or? Oh, gosh. Uh, here's what, brother, I'd rather come back to you with a precise answer if we right. do it on that, just, just rather than give you a number tonight. Sure. But, uh, I can't tell you that, that that's fairly typical of the way we would do in the Morris footprint that they acquired, is that you would build off that. You would also identify uh, homes which might qualify as unserved. Right. Now, sometimes in an unserved, you have an FCC definition of it, which would be below 25.3 speeds. This is where I'm going to let Bob, if you've got anything, because he, as you can tell, he's got some gray hair about the broadband <laughs> issues over the years. So, uh, Bob, um, you want to add anything? No, yeah, typically, uh, you know, if, if the network is already offering gigabyte speeds, which I think 95% of Morris's footprint currently is where they already serve, so you'd be expanding from that to get additional customers. So we, we, we can give you this, you know, precise numbers on that. Yeah, we're we're real excited about the uh, funding that's out there. Uh, your competitor was in um, a meeting or two ago and was letting us know what they were, could do in their area. Sure. And uh, um, if uh, you could work with Mr. Wooten, if there's anything to do to uh, increase that because of the uh, level of the county. Uh, currently, there's about 40% that does not have broadband at their house. So okay. um, now, that could be because of the expense, but it also is because of the location too. So, um, but if you can do that, that would be greatly appreciated. So one thing we're doing, and we're uh, at, at counties we operate in, not just North Carolina, but any other state. And I've had discussions on the eastern side of the state about this. Uh, so what we're able to do is present a preliminary map and we're getting to these states. It's just a backlog. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have that for you tonight. Uh, it's, it's in the pipeline to be finished here within the next two weeks. And at that point, I should be able to get back to you with the technology we use and say, uh, we've identified X number of homes in North Carolina so far, just to give you an estimate, Craven County, a large county, you might have nearly 20,000 unserved homes you've identified. A smaller county like Martin County, uh, you may have 2,000 you've identified. So, I mean, it really runs the gamut. Uh, and at that point, I can, that's why I didn't want to quite answer your question on which sure. areas we were going into, because I want to see what that map shows me, and that'll give us a better idea of it. Right. Uh, you know, we'd like to welcome you back and uh, work on 
getting some of those numbers for us. Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. And when we look at those, uh, and the maps will show you, I won't get into too much detail without an actual map here, but you'll see areas and they'll break them down into colors that are red, green, and yellow as they as they do the lines. And you go into a green area and that'll tell you that you have, I don't know, over a hundred people per square homes per, per mile that you'll have. You get into a red area, for example, and it's like maybe maybe 25 homes that you can pass within a mile. It's those that we're hopeful of future funding, and I'm sure the company that spoke to you about this also mentioned that what you're going to want in that case is, uh, well, any private company is going to want a little assistance or a little likely to serve those red areas where you're just not going to pass very many homes. Right. There's a reason that hasn't been done now. It's just unfortunately not the, uh, it's not as cost efficient for a company to do. But right. I mean, we may never, this may be the equivalent of uh, the electrification of rural America in the 1930s. We may never get this opportunity again for, uh, exactly. for building out broadband. Right. So listen, we want to be an active partner with you. And I will set up, uh, Mr. Chairman, more meetings with you guys in the coming, uh, coming weeks, particularly once I have that map. I just needed that to be able to talk more. Uh, yeah, and when you get that together and get some numbers, uh, contact uh, Mr. Wooten, uh, okay. county yeah, manager, good. and uh, we'd be glad to see our time. And Bob and I will come back over and, and be glad to talk to you, gentlemen, okay. and ladies. <laughs> Mars Broadband stretched fiber in the uh, Glenwood area down the Bethel Church Road last year. Mm -hmm. There is, it goes right dead through my yard, okay? Mm -hmm. There has been, there's nothing we don't know anywhere where it stands, where it doesn't stand. There's no numbers to call. I mean, and I get calls a lot on this, you know. When's this going live? When's, when, when are they going to come back through? Is there anywhere I can reach out to get them? Absolutely. The I'll give you, I'll give you a card right now. Yes, ma'am. If you'll, uh, I have, I'll give you a card that has my email address on it. Ashley has my information as well. Uh, just tell me your district or give me an address to work from, and we can have the folks over in Hendersonville uh, run those numbers, uh, 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 the metrics, and see what the issue is. Look, look at the... Uh, the time frame for what the holdup is now is it and there's been no communication you say in well i called the number in hendersonville she looked on the map for my address and told me that it would not be served i said well honey it went right there through my yard okay. i said so you know they may just not have had uploaded the address at the time i know that does tend to happen right. in the industry but such right. rapid growth it's just a little bit of a lag time sometimes in those addresses being entered but uh Okay. Uh, that shouldn't be a problem. I'll, I'll get you on. All right. Uh, Thank and you. Just, just real general, uh, approximately 13,000 homes do not have broadband. Okay. There's two horses in in the fight that we're, we're wanting to feed, you being one. The other one is uh, a little less than 6,000 homes that they're going to try to help sure. on that 13,000. So uh, we do have opportunity here, and we are wanting to know specifics. Right. And, exactly right whatever you can do uh, because we do want to have a relationship with you and get this working so that the grant funding can happen absolutely you know north carolina uh you're very fortunate in the uh uh over to have the, the department of information technology already in place and i'll tell you just as you look around the country i can't say that for a lot of states that we serve north carolina is very much ahead of the game and that you already have a functioning system in place for administering the great grants so whether it's ARPA funding or whatever else comes through that, you've got the folks in place to administer that grant, and they know how to do it. Uh, they're going, as I've told several legislators, they're going to need to staff up over there. Because you have like you can count on two hands the number of employees in that whole uh, office, and suddenly this tidal wave of federal money that's coming through uh, to use that, that that the states will use is I, I believe at this point now the legislature was still ironing it out the last I checked but they're going to probably use that model of the great grants to go through and do it so um, if you talk to your legislators uh, give them a push yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. yeah with with the availability of the uh, federal money and the state money how aggressive are you in expanding your footprint well we've been very aggressive in, in expanding even before a lot of the ARPA dollars were even uh, talked about it. Now, that's what a lot of the Morris uh, employees are excited about. Tony Carter was the general manager over there, and I know Tony's been over here and knows Ashley, but uh, they, we actually came in, and what, what they said was it's kind of exciting to be acquired, if that's ever a good thing. When, when you're the one being acquired, it's a little nerve-wracking, I'm sure. But what they said is you're talking about the nation's fourth largest broadband provider, which can actually come in and do these types of upgrades, things that Tony probably would have had on his wish list years ago, but 
you know, there's only so much dollars to go around when you're a small company. Altice is glad to invest in this type of market. Uh, just acquiring it added approximately 35,000 new subscribers. And I'm seeing expansion plans that aren't even, that I'm not even talking about you tonight, but they've just gone in and can easily say, yeah, we can build off of that. And we're seeing that type of growth already. So federally, uh, I'm currently working primarily in three states on, uh, on this. And North, mainly because North Carolina is so well set up, as I said, with DIT to do this. North Carolina is going to be a great market for us to do that in, uh, particularly here in the western part of the state. So uh, uh, when I come back to you with that map, you'll, you'll see yeah, exactly we, kind we, of our plans. We really like what you're saying. We just, uh, uh, speaking for myself and I think the board as well, we like uh, maps, numbers, and computers. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> and there I'm pushing them to get those to me. I got, uh, they got me uh, last week, week before last, just before Labor Day, uh, the eastern part of the state, and I said, "Okay, guys, I need uh, I need the western state part now." So we have five counties here uh, that I want to try to go all the way up to Ash County, down to these counties that we want to uh, to try to make that same outreach to. Great, right, thank you. you yes, sir. Mm -hmm. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to working with you guys. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda is old business. Uh, I may under old business, uh, we've got the uh, salary study proposal, Mr. Wood. Yes, sir. I uh, kind of lose track of the time uh, these days, but several months ago, uh, you voted uh, to direct staff to find firms that are in the business of doing pay and classification studies. And so, uh, uh, Ms. Presswood, who couldn't be here with us tonight, uh, HR director, had put out uh, an RFP for uh, that purpose. I mentioned last month we had two firms submit uh, identically priced proposals, which was uh, interesting, to say the least. Uh, and so you directed that we uh, narrowed down to one. Uh, so we met a week or two after that uh, meeting. Uh, with the two companies uh, and essentially an interview about the process and uh, their firms and um, history and who would be on the team, et cetera. Uh, and so it was very difficult. Uh, it was sort of a razor's edge sort of discussion and decision uh, as far as a recommendation, but uh, we did uh, come together with the feeling that the MAPS group maybe is the best fit for us right now. Could have been uh, the other group, and what is just as fine. Uh, so you do have that proposal in front of you, and uh, answered a question or two about the process, about what they would do. Uh, if you have any other que questions about process, or any uh, uh, questions of me, uh, I'd be glad to take them. Well, I just <clears throat> personally, uh, and, uh, I don't know if we get the consensus for everybody, but personally. My thought on this is I'd rather see the money spent in giving pay increases to those that are in the lower pay skills that need it at this particular time than spend that money on having the uh, study done. That, that's where I'm at on it. You know, I'd rather see that $30,000, $40,000, whatever it is we're talking about spending there. I'd rather see it spent on uh, increasing uh, wages within the system on those that are already underpaid. Ms. Wooten, one question I have, and uh, we got together earlier and you answered a lot of them, but one question I've got for staff is this. The board's made a, a definite commitment to uh, try to take care of our employees, and that is a, that is a goal because of the uh, retention factor and the comp competitive nature of the, the job and, and and the location geographically they can drive to another location pretty quickly but one question I've got uh, is, is this do we have funds when a study's done and the study will take approximately four months uh, do you have identified funds to implement the uh, changes that would be forthcoming To your question, are there funds set aside at this point 
for any increases that might be recommended. So you're asking? Mm -hmm. No, not at this point. I, I think it, so that's maybe a quick answer. <laughs> Expound a little bit. It, it's sort of a chicken and egg situation, uh, perhaps, where we don't really know where uh, the deficiencies are, if there are any that exist, to know maybe what a dollar amount would be. So, no, to your to your question, uh, under uh, letters and numbers here, but the transfer station, I don't know how much that would cost, or where those funds would come unnecessarily, but knowing that for that item, we talk about, we, we need to plan and understand and then figure out cost. So it, maybe apples and oranges, but no. Long answer, not at this point. Um, I think and, with those, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, one, I'll just follow up with this. One thing that, that I would hate to see occur is a study's done and, and you've got an idea sort of where you're low at and where you're all right at. But, and, and looking at the, the uh, proposal from the MAPS group, they're going to be interviewing every permanent full-time employee we have. They're going to ask them a, a whole series of questions. Uh, so it's going to be a, a lot of data. And, and I don't want to create, if we don't have the money to do it, here, here's my take on the whole thing. If we don't have the money to implement at this time what would be recommended and our employees who are great and we've got the best employees in the state and we'll retain them. But I don't want to give them a false sense of hope that hey, this is going to start per their timeline uh, September now. And they'll wind up four months from now with the data coming back to the board. I don't want to create a false sense of hope that hey, in four months or five months when this is presented to this board knowing that you've already said we don't have the money to do it, uh, that they're going to go ahead and, and I would be just like they would be. If I was a county employee and the county's doing a study, uh, I would expect when the study's completed that if I'm deficient or lower in whatever my job title is and it says I need to be raised to whatever that study would say, I would expect to be raised then. Uh, I, I'm, you know, and I think that uh, you could do some damage or not you, but the board could could possibly do some uh, damage by not being ready at that time to go to the recommended levels. I've got no issue at all taking our people to the levels they should be at that are competitive with anybody around us. I've got zero issue with that because I want to I want to get there. I want our people to be uh, what the market would bring anywhere that that we're compared to. Number one. But number two, though, I, I think you might, um, we, we would be sort of deficient, I would say, if we would <laughs> say, let's do the study and authorize $32,000, and then four months from now, five months down the road, we're sitting in the same room, all right, here's where they should be, but we don't have the money to do it. I think that we need to go ahead and, and uh, be planning to go ahead and, and at your recommendation, the staff's recommendation, when we have appropriate funding in place, uh, when if you've got to take two years and, and uh, go through the budget cycle and just give an estimate of what's it going to take, a million dollars or a million and a half dollars, you don't know. I, I get it, and we need to know. Uh, but I think I would want to go ahead and be putting money back in a process of a year or two to where when the study's done, the study can occur pretty quick. You're five, four months, it says, per their timeline to have the study done. So it's not the issue of it's going to take a year or a year and a half to get the information back to us. But I do not want to go ahead and authorize a study tonight that we don't have funds to take care of. And I don't want to create false hope uh, and create expectation because if I was a county employee and we got quite a few of them in this room tonight, I would want to be, I, I would expect if if the commissioners were doing a study that when that study is complete and that data is given that at that appropriate time, at that time we'd be moved up, bumped up to what we should be. That's my take on it. I'm not a bit against it. I, I like the fact that uh, it, it's going to be reviewed, but I think maybe uh, it might be, it, and there needs to be some more time, I think, to, be, to make sure, according to staff, 
that we can pay for it. Because you're saying we can't pay for it right now. And and how can we do something, authorize something? And that's my take on it. I don't see how we could ever plan ahead without some facts underneath us either. If you don't do a study and you don't know what you're looking at ahead, how do you plan? How do you lay that aside? I think we need to study across the board to know where seem, we stand and how we stand so that we can plan ahead. It would seem to me that, you know, that you and uh, our county manager and uh, Maria uh, would already have an idea by just doing a simple comparison to surrounding counties of where we stand. Uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I personally, I would rather see the money, personally, I'd rather see that money spent on a study, spent in raising the salaries of some of those that are already underpaid, and you know that they're underpaid. And I know that uh, you know uh, there are certain individuals that are not paid what they should be paid. Uh, uh, in, in different areas in the county. Uh, can you expound on that? I, I will say we, uh, I'll speak for myself and on Maria's behalf, I feel like we're very smart people. Uh, she's smarter than me uh, for not being here, but uh, capacity, staff capacity, time, knowledge, experience, we don't have to do what uh, these folks are doing. There's just no way. But you know, we know we have a sense about where some of our weaknesses are as far as compensation uh, in some of our departments. It's not 100% across the board necessarily uh, if you're looking at however you define our market. But we have a sense. Some in this room, uh, departments especially, have a greater sense than I do because they've lost employees to uh, neighboring counties. Sometimes it's bunkum, but it's not always. And so those department heads and others, uh, they'll reach out to me and say, I lost another one to so-and-so county, because they could, or city, or sometimes it is private, um, because of what they're able to pay more. And so we can't compete with bunkum. We will never compete with bunkum, you know? But the challenge to what Commissioner Vaughn is saying, it, it is the chicken and egg, but also to what Vice Chairman Walker is saying, no, we don't have a pot of money set aside for any, any increases. And so that I've warned several of you, if we don't have the money to do everybody all at once in July, and you have to sort of cherry pick uh, uh, slices is how I think one of the firms talked about. They would slice uh, maybe a third of one department, a third of this one, a third, whatever, to implement something based on available funds. But I don't see how you can, uh, and I said this to you today, I don't see how you can go in, say, uh, uh, the Sheriff's Department and say, we think that one third of this group needs raises now, and the other two thirds, it'd be later down the road. I mean, I don't see how you do that. That would be a challenge, uh, also taking one department over another would be a that's why I'm saying if you don't have the money to do something you might ought to wait till you can properly do it I know this is uh, our tenth month and our first uh, meeting uh, sheriff showed up and was asking for a pretty good lump sum and we got into it real deep real quick uh, uh, talking about different departments of who needs what, what needs who, and brought up this discussion. Uh, I, uh, my personal feeling is I think that we, as a county, need to ask staff to have a two-year firm budget with a third-year estimated budget, including in that is salaries. Because when we were going through that, we had an idea Okay, let's say we do this. On the people that are making more money than what's being done, are we going to cut their pay? No. No, we're not going to do that. So with that being said, my opinion is we've got to have a budget. We've got to have a capital expenditure plan. If we don't have that, yeah, this is going to be part of the pie. But the 
tail is still wagging the dog. We've got to have a budget. We've got to have this department, this department, this department, this department, all stating this is where I am with surrounding counties. This is where I am. And then they present to us. Uh, he presents to us. This is what I need. And we can either do it or we can't. I think we're looking at it a little forward. I do think that it's needed. Not at this time. I think it needs to be tabled at this time. I do think that we really need a budget. And I think we need a budget of two or three year plan, not just salaries, but buildings, the buildings that they're in, buildings or assets that they have, so that we have an understanding of transit, of ambulances, of buildings, of, uh, of it all. Because this is one aspect of our thing, and we've got to do our due diligence. And it's his job to make sure that that's done, not ours. That's my opinion. And I'm not meaning that bad. I'm just, you know, I, and it's the department heads to let you know what they need. Because I didn't, I didn't like, I do appreciate Sheriff coming saying, I gotta have help. I'm losing guys left and right. And he was, and we did something. And we did something for the entire county, which was needed. But that's my opinion. I think we've got to say we need a budget and go from there. And the budget, in my mind, needs to be a three-year budget right now. And then after we get that, after we understand what's going on there, we can get more modified into the total assets, labor, everything else. Discussion. I agree with what Brenda said, Commissioner Vaughn, as far as needing to know where our baseline is now. And I understand what Commissioner Walker is saying as well. If you don't have the funds, it's hard to say, hey, we're doing a study to look into it and then don't give you anything. I understand that. Um, it's obviously both sides. As far as uh, the job descriptions, job titles, how vital would that help you as the county staff? We, uh, as far as I understand uh, from conversation with Ms. Presswood, we have about 95% of our positions uh, as far as being uh, job descriptions. And the other 5% we are actively working on. Um, that's something that we identified maybe about two years ago that we all kind of inherited where there, there were none, uh, wasn't kept up. So we've strived to get that up to 100%. Um, the part where they do the interviews, uh, they will look at the current job description and say, okay, this doesn't match what you're telling me right now. And so there is a, uh, a true thing or whatever to that description. And a lot of that also is to, to make sure they're matching apples to apples. So a deputy one uh, here may be doing what deputy two in Caldwell County or wherever else might be doing. So it's just a true uh, titles to make sure they're comparing apples to apples. That's just one question. Okay. Whose responsibility is it to uh, formulate or make a job description for a county employee? If it's a new position, it would be the uh, combination between the department head okay. and the HR director. Typically, on, the burden would be on the department head to make sure, especially a new position. Because I don't see how you can hire uh, and post an advertising for a position if there's not a job description for it. Nothing that we've posted would okay. have not a job description. Any other discussion? I tend to agree with uh, Commissioner Ellis on the, on, on the path that uh, he's talking about. You know, I think there needs to be, certainly needs to be, uh, staff needs to have a discussion with uh, department heads and, and find out the sole direction in which we need to be going and looking at where the weaknesses are and uh, the uh, underpaid employees are. You know, I think that's something that uh, you and uh, uh, department heads could uh, figure out and then 
bring back to us. Uh, so, uh, anyway, other comments, questions? I also agree with Commissioner Ellis that if we table this and come back to it with more, what, what he's saying as far as the plan so many years out, we may be better off there. I want to see a dollar, I want to see how we're going to pay for it. I mean, I, that's just short and simple. How are you going to pay for it? And then I think then we can move forward. And, and uh, until we know how we're going to pay for it, I think, you know, it's great that, that you're, we're getting the information, but here again, you've got to be able to pay for it. And I don't want to create a false sense of hope that when a study's done, there's not money to pay for it. They're going to be mad, and rightfully so. I, I would be right with you. I really wouldn't think, though, that the people that are doing the study would be promising one of our no, no, that's that, what they're going to be making, you know? They're, they're going to be looking at the data from all the other areas, and then they're going to say, this is the recommended salary for that whatever position. They should position be is. discussing that with the people. They should be discussing that with my county manager. Well, they're going to meet with every employee and uh, just to get information. But in the end, they'll give a uh, dollar amount to what that position would bring after doing the study. And what I'm saying is, Brenda, when they give that information to him and then to us, if we don't have money to do it, are we creating a false sense of hope? there. You know, that's, that's why I but want to make sure. But we have to know, it's kind of like buying a car. You go to the lot and you figure out what it costs and then you figure out how you're going to pay for it, right? But as Tony said, though, they've got an idea of roughly uh, of where we're weak at right now. We they've already got an idea. We do have charts of yeah. where the different departments were, not just the sheriff's department. Right. And with that, um, the specifics of this would be beneficial if uh, if we knew where we were headed as far as budgetary wise. Because, I mean, we got to look at income and revenues, tax, all that stuff. We do. But um, there might be some. The numbers are there for you to see. That, yeah, the numbers are there in comparison to the counties, surrounding counties of, of some things, and some of the departments were uh, a little high. And again, if this is done, do we back them down, or do we say you're capped off until other counties are coming up? I, I already know some of the departments that uh, that are weak at the pay scale is down. I mean, I, I can look at the numbers myself. Oh yeah, oh, yeah and yeah. I have looked at it. Yeah, and I can already identify two or three places where people are underpaid, and uh, you know, I just uh, to to give a three percent pay raise to all county employees is what's that house is six hundred thousand dollars roughly. So there's your some, there's your number right there. If you just gave a three percent increase to every position you've got currently, that's six hundred thousand mm dollars. -hmm. I think that's where a pay study would come in that you would kind of begin to balance that out and not have some that are high according and some that are low according. I think that's what a pay study does is bring things more in a line. Moving forward then. Let's uh, hear something. I'll make a motion to table the uh, pay study, uh, but I would also like to uh, ask staff to have department heads come up with a departmental budget. Um, and I don't know what's fair, <coughs> but. Uh, um, but I do think that we need to, uh, I think we need to have something out there maybe four months out the road uh, as far as departmental budget so we can kind of have an idea of what we're, what we're looking at. I'll second, I'll second the motion for, for discussion purposes. Uh, so uh, your thought is for staff to come back to us, say January with some... Uh, with budgets per department. So we have better understanding because I guarantee you department heads know who's paid good who's not paid good exactly and so i'm clear you're looking just at compensation not moving up the budget process six months i'm not moving up the budget process six months i'm talking about a budget that we don't have uh first month i was here i asked for could i see the five-year budget you said we don't have it i said well 
okay, well, I would like to have, that's what I'm at. I'm asking for a three year budget now. And after we get that, and after we get familiar with it, then maybe we'll go to a five year budget. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. But if we could do that by, Jan by the January meeting, that would be good. I don't know that that would be possible. Uh, well, I mean, and, and that's for discussion. So, well, to, in fact, to, to chime in, so the department heads have already presented through their budget request for this year. For this year. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I think, in all fairness to them, that we might need to just it, table it and, and give that more time to run its course and, and review it because they're going to, have to recommend, um, like you said, they, the, the funding for this at the appropriate time. And that would give a full doctor's look at where you're at with buildings, grounds, maintenance, uh, debt, service, new debt coming on, debt I'll, coming off. I'll and change my motion to April because is that not when you start talking to the department heads about <clears throat> budget process? No, we start in February, yeah. usually, the department heads. And that would coincide more in line with what the norm is currently, the normal practice to to see where they're at and, and they can determine their needs and, and start presenting then. Well, tell me what my motion needs to be. Does it need to be by May so that it's it's good, so there's no extra pressure at this well, time? Yeah, you know, the July is the deadline, so uh, you know you you basically uh, you know May June you know somewhere it, it, we're getting to the so end. we'll finalize it by June the thirtieth. Yeah, well, let's just do it that way. Change my motion to that timeline so that it's effective for uh, upcoming budget year. And so the, the only thing really different that you're asking them to do is to provide a three year budget. A three year budget plan so that we can look at where we are so that it's a, um, because I mean, I, if you talk to- I don't think, I don't know that you could do a, a, a three year budget on everything. Could you? We could present, she's gonna try and throw something at me, but um, we can present estimates on historical data as far as revenues. Okay. Um, you know, sales tax goes up and down. It's been up because of uh, Washington printing money, but that may go away. It is going away to where sales tax may very well go down and property tax is probably going to be stable as far as we know. So all we can do is project. Sure. Um, we can do more than project on some expenses. Sure. We know we have a big debt uh, payment increase coming July 1 for the emergency services headquarters. Sure. That's the big looming increase that we know is coming July 1. Beyond that, you know, things that you want to do isn't necessarily a commitment, whether sure. it's school or college or pay increases or whatever else. But at least it'll give us a guideline we can we can project yes and uh, it wouldn't be a uh, few counties our size do that uh, and lower uh, but we are talking about census in a little bit we're, we're entering that range where uh, a lot of counties our size and larger are starting to do more projection because um, just a thing to do so so I'm clear we're, we're tabling this and until it's starting in, in July. We're tabling this indefinitely until we bring it back up, if there is a okay. need to bring it back up in my motion. But I also want to have a uh, estimated budgetary plan uh, by the end of this fiscal year, ending end of June. I think, I think I understand exactly what you're trying to get at to where uh, Vice Chairman's point Let's see how the budget works out to where funding availability, and you could authorize something, I may have put words in your mouth, but I authorized something based on this and then the process of study, if that's the desire, based on what we're seeing in the budget process. A future I may, I may be going not, way beyond what you're, you're committing to. At a future date, but it's not in my motion. You understand what Just, I'm saying? This is, we're, hey, we're, we're on tabling. hold. We're yes. on hold. They're not doing anything. We're not doing anything. That's correct. Except researching, if nothing else. So your motion is just to table, table. this. Table this indefinitely. 
but then get them started on the budget plan so that we kind of have an idea in, in the budget plan. So when we talk about budget next year uh, in the spring, we're going to have some references to salaries and stuff like that a little bit better so that it helps the department head that is um, lower in the pay scale and it helps us too with the people that are paying a little bit higher than the average than surrounding counties and it, it helps us all out both what so i think they could know a lot of you uh, we got a i would amend my second to uh what commissioner Ellis has stated there uh, with one question mr wooten get back to a percentage basis and we know three percent uh would uh, generate there would would need would uh, be six hundred thousand dollars to give a three and three quarter pay raise to county employees all full time that's six hundred thousand dollars so just a swag just just this is a rough swag not asking you this is not site this is not scientific this is not big but what do you think i mean you know we and i agree with what commissioner Vaughn said you know it, it's kind of hard to hit an unknown target but just a three percent uh, raise is six hundred thousand dollars percentage basis where do you think just where do you think we're at how what percentage are we off if you, if you look at the good the bad well that's not gonna that's not gonna help those that are underpaid that are not up at the scale they need to be no, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not even, i'm just want just sort of see trying to get to a dollar man i respect the question i respect right. you all greatly i don't feel comfortable putting the number on it right. because and i'll squirrel out that one i guess i'll try because you do have some departments uh, that are probably closer to whatever the market is in some way under. So I, I don't fancy okay. for it. I respect that, no, no problem. Toss. So we have a motion and a second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor of Commissioner Anderson's motion? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Gets four, one. Okay. Moving on to item B, building projects update. Mr. Wood. Yes, sir. I'll uh, move quickly. I know it's getting late for everybody. Uh, so just uh, a couple of items here. Do you have maybe an uh, action item if you'd like? Uh, if not, it's okay. Uh, just talk quickly about the administrative offices on North Main Street. Um, had an opportunity to go in there Friday with staff. Uh, they are working, some of you might have seen, on the, uh, the main level and then the lower level. Uh, there's stud walls up in most of this uh, space that are going to have additional rooms put in that weren't there before. There's drywall being stored, things like that. So it's um, still on track. Uh, you might have seen where uh, 4th Street was closed over the past week. That was for some planned sewer work that we're having done. So um, just a lot of moving parts and pieces. And so uh, Mr. Poyster, Mr. Hamrick, and uh, Morrison Construction are doing a, a great job there keeping that moving. Uh, mentioned the headquarters. That is also uh, doing really well. I haven't talked a lot about it, uh, maybe just one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, all of our contractors and all our projects have seen additional uh, material costs. And uh, and that a lot of these, all of it, one were bid just, uh, six, nine months ago, if not longer. And prices have just been fluctuating up and down, uh, mostly up. Um, and Mr. Hamrick has been involved in pretty much all of these projects and he has held firm on the pricing because uh, he understands that we have a limited amount of resources here. He is sympathetic to the contractors but understands we don't have a money tree for uh, unforeseen items. And so he's done a great job to represent you uh, to uh, hold these prices uh, to the contract. And so I really appreciate him for his efforts there. I mentioned, uh, I'll talk about shooting range really quickly. Uh, there's some initial uh, work started on the foundations for the physical structures. Uh, the building, office building, uh, will be started very soon. And I mentioned um, 
Uh, Mr. Marsh will be back in front of you in the next couple of months about operations. So days you want to be open more specifically than uh, there's anything else. Uh, did put out, uh, uh, Ms. Cheryl uh, Mitchell did, um, part of the board, um, some possible names for what has always been called the County Administration Building. It's 60 East Court Street. A lot of people have, since I worked there and maybe even since, have called it the basement of the courthouse. It's a separate building. Um, and it was hard to identify before um, prior board put the motto on the building. Uh, it's just that the open white building. Uh, but it's always been the County Administration Building. We had talked before since administrative offices technically aren't really in there now and will not return, bordering, et cetera. Maybe renaming that building might be a good idea to cut down on confusion. So we put some suggestions at your table. If you like any of these, if you don't, uh, open a suggestion. But uh, it is adjacent to the courthouse. Uh, not necessarily a fan of the word annex, but uh, courthouse annex, courthouse annex building has been suggested. The services building. And then a plain old office building has been suggested. The idea would be to keep McDowell County in place and then change the second line that currently says administration building. So open to suggestion, it's your decision. Uh, these are just uh, four possibilities, and there may be 400 others. Just a question on the yes, building that's uh, on Main Street that uh, the old Kirksey, uh, is that going to be? Uh, something similar to the McDowell County Office Building, or what? What is that going? McDowell to be? County Administrative Offices has so, been just sort of the shorthand right now. Um, yeah. I mentioned that at a prior meeting, and there was, I don't think there was a vote of endorsement. I think there was a nod that that sounded okay, but again, that's subject to a different name if you like. Yeah, it sounds good to me. As far as this one. I've got no issue. I like the McDowell County Courthouse Annex, but uh, anybody? <laughs> I don't like that because I'm not going to choose the general vicinity. Services building because it's not the courthouse. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't think the courthouse needs to be tied to it. Well, I'll go to McDowell County, County Services County 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 Building. Let's do that. Yeah, I would have a motion that one. I make a motion. We uh, name the building. The McDowell County Services Building. Second. We got a motion and a second. Have any more discussion? I'm sort of flipping it around. I, I'm still not totally sold on I like the office building too. Uh, we've got a motion second. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor of that? Aye. Uh -huh. We've got a five of Okay, that's taken care of. Next on the agenda, you're, you're done with those? Yes, sir. Thank okay, you. Okay, uh, I'll see the uh, fire review real quick. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you directed, I believe, that the June, uh, Mayor June uh, joined me with City Council that staff <coughs> at both at least work on a draft uh, agreement. Uh, between the two entities. I believe the last update was maybe 2005 or six. And so we, uh, uh, Mr. Boyette, found some samples from other counties. We took the contract we've used with uh, several of our departments and uh, cherry picked some of the uh, parts and pieces. So if you want to treat this as a first reading of uh, this draft, uh, Mr. Keller and his staff have looked at it I believe Ms. Bell has looked at it. I've not sent it to the city yet. Um, figure since you were the uh, maybe the driver behind it, start here and then get any additions or deletions you'd like to make. Are you, you just say it's first rating that uh, that's is what option. you want? That's an option. That's what is that a motion? Is that your recommendation? Yeah. Yes, sir. If you okay, make a motion. This is the first reading for that. Motion. Second. Got a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Moving on now to new business. Uh, item A, 
Census 2020 update, Mr. Lee. Thank you. Um, Ms. Fuller mentioned uh, the census earlier. Uh, I believe it was August 12th where these numbers were released. It says that memo. Um, I think uh, I was at a meeting when I read this and my jaw might have hit the table when I read it. Uh, it's one of those things where the impression I had was that we would have some level of growth. And when we didn't, I was uh, surprised and maybe a little disappointed. Uh, but also maybe not completely surprised based on the year we were having with COVID and everything else going on. And so we have talked with the, uh, the city and the town, um, obviously disappointed with uh, both of those entities as well. Uh, there is a process. I don't have a lot of detail about the process yet because they've not released it in the Census Bureau, but we do have information that in January they will allow a slight uh, appeal of the numbers. They're not going to send enumerators back out. Uh, to do the process all over again, but they will uh, essentially audit uh, the housing counts. If there was like a group home that was missed, they will look for those, those sorts of things. I have talked to Carol about that, Ms. Fuller. Uh, Foothills Regional Commission could probably help with this process and in talking with the other two entities, it seemed like something that the other two would want to do, the city and the town. So I don't have an action item for you as far as a contract or anything yet, but if there was a consensus to keep moving forward. I would encourage an audit on that myself because that, that could affect this county. Uh, it affects the money we were saying. Yeah, so that, that could affect this financial. I think some of it had to do with the fact that a lot of it was done on the internet. And as we know, we don't have that covered completely in our county. So people are afraid to go to the door and right. all kinds of things right. so i think it i think it was just circumstances yeah i support an audit on that okay uh that's all you had on that yes sir okay out of the uh the transfer station plan thank you uh we initiated uh, Ms. fuller talked about things the state makes us do sometimes we don't like that um maybe we'll say all the time but uh, sometimes when uh, there is a sort of a forced study or evaluation that does bring to light some things. And so the state did uh, adopt a rule uh, within the past year or so that each operator of a transfer station had uh, and waste collection facility had to do a, a, an evaluation of their facilities. So we have a, a firm named LaBella who we worked uh, with for a number of years. They did that study. It was about three pages. It was very basic. It met the requirements of what the state was looking for that's been submitted. Uh, and as far as we know, there's um, Mr. Boyster uh, is here as well. There's been no feedback on that from the state because they had over 100 come in all at once. We do anticipate some feedback from the state based on some of the items talked about as far as condition, age, uh, etc. that they will recommend some investments into that facility. It's about 30 years old, which is about the lifespan of that facility. 35 to 40 on the, you know, the one end. And we're definitely approaching that lifespan limit. And so LaBella, LaBella uh, the firm, uh, has put together a proposal to not just rebuild the facility unless that turns out to be the only viable spot, but also look at the entire property, uh, old landfill, wood waste pile, metal pile, etc. All of that property that we control in 226 South to understand is there a better design? Uh, we talked about in this room before about safety, uh, trucks going in and out, where we also have uh, residential traffic at our convenience site. They'll look at these things under the study um, to prepare us for that that next step, which is probably going to be a, a probably a replacement of that transfer station, based on what they're telling us. So we need to have a plan. So you're saying that the life expectancy is five years tops, probably. 
Probably. Okay. I make a motion we approve the site uh, evaluation and the funds are covered under budget funds within that department, correct? That's right. Okay. Another so, motion to second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you, Mr. Wooten. Uh, administrative items. You have a couple items here. The first item, um, the agency, Ms. Fuller, uh, works for, as you heard, has been renamed the Foothills Regional Commission. Uh, it also is involved with the, the Region C Workforce Development Board. That's an entity that you appoint members to. Uh, that entity would like to uh, rename itself to the, uh, the Foothills. A regional Workforce Development Board. So you have a resolution. Mr. Chairman, make a motion to approve the resolution as presented. Second. In discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Any opposed? Uh, September is maybe a little early to talk about Christmas decorating, uh, but you too have a request from the City of Marion to participate in their uh, efforts to improve the decorations along Main Street. Uh, this has been talked about in a utility committee meeting. Uh, there's been a maybe an ask that the county participate at the $2,400 level, which is about the cost of one of the uh, large decorations at Main Street in close proximity to the new building. It's a pleasure, board, on their request. Is that your recommendation? This sort of item, I'll leave to your discretion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we take. Uh, 2500 out of the uh, courthouse project fund that where there's an overage and uh, buy one that goes across the, the street. Second. Got a motion to second the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, you have ES, EMS write offs. Uh, do those separate? Yeah, the force. What's the pleasure the board on those? Chair, make a motion to approve the write-offs as presented. Second. Okay. Motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, now you have three budget amendments, GF1, 2, and SP1. you have any questions, please let me Mr. Chairman, I've got a question on GF1, the uh, $225,000, $226,000. Where was that, uh, where was that, what was that for again? On the sales tax? Yeah, GF1. Uh, every year, um, if the county is buying something from Walmart or online vendor or whatever, uh, we pay sales tax. And so that goes to the state and it goes to us. We are allowed to file for reimbursement uh, with the state. And so we receive whatever we've paid out to the vendor, we receive it back. So this is a pass-through where we're, we're paying up front and then we're receiving uh, those funds back uh, after a couple of months. It's a complete pass-through. We don't spend it, we don't you know, recoup it later. Mr. Chairman, make a motion to approve GF1, GF2, uh, and uh, Amendment SP1 as presented. Got a motion? Second. Got a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, next, is that all that? Which way you go? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, we're on the yeah. I think we're in give the video. Yeah, we're, uh, uh, we're out of date. Tax matters. Mr. Wood will give us an update on tax matters. Uh, tax matters are, are routine. Uh, you do have some uh, write offs, 10 uh, year write offs for the 2010 taxes um, from Ms. Diane Frey and her memo there. Please Chairman, we'll go ahead. Make a motion we approve the tax write-offs as requested. Second. Motion is second. In discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? While we're here too, uh, Mr. Chairman, I know that we do a discount program in June and July, and uh, I had a conversation with a tax um, collector and. Um, I would like staff to visit and you report back to the board next month on what that cost to the county is in form of uh, the discount given and to give guidance on that from a staff level. Okay, yes sir. 
Okay, next item A, board appointments. Madam Clerk. Yes, sir, we have one um, vacancy for the planning board, and this is the first reading. So I'll advertise that and bring it back next month. Okay, thank you. Okay, now, uh, so some time for citizen comments. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, you added two items. I think one was the rest of the oh, yeah, yeah, excuse me. No. Yeah, item F. Yeah, we added to new business. Item yeah. F was the uh, the uh, American Relief Plan. Uh, sure. Uh, on the American Relief Plan, we have the four point four million dollars that is is very limited in scope as to what we can spend it on, and uh, we uh, understand that. The county's been working for 18 years on trying to develop a water filtration plant. We bought two tracts of land and we, for an intake. Right now, the county's dependent upon Buck Creek as its sole water source. And with the lake in the process of that, that's been, been occurring for the last 18 years to uh, get that lake declared as a water source for Meadow County. Uh, with the funding that we have available, $4.4 .4 million available now, restricted, uh, limited in use and what we can use it, spend it on. And we have another, the, the remaining $4.4 .4 million will be in the county hands in how long, Mr. Wooten? 10 Six. months, roughly? In about uh, eight or nine months. Eight or nine months. Uh, I would like to go ahead and, and uh, since we did, did receive a letter from the state stating that in our water fund, uh, we need to uh, work on that. Also, uh, we do understand Per the state, we cannot take any revenue out of the general fund and expend on a water, our water fund. The, the state won't allow that. Right. Yeah, so I want to go ahead and make a motion tonight that we go ahead and uh, designate $4 million of that money to go towards uh, water infrastructure uh, lines in the ground to try to develop that system. We've got a motion. We got yeah, a motion. We've got a motion on that uh, before we can have any discussion. We'll have to have a second on it. I second that. Okay. Uh, now, as far as discussion, uh, on my part, uh, I'll go ahead and give you my spill on it. I, I agree with that, uh, with laying that uh, earmarking $4 million to be used on water, water treatment for the county. I, I agree with that. The only thing I would do to say different, I would say that I think we should do it at uh, two million intervals, do two million off the first disbursement we get, and then two million off the second. That would uh, free up another two million for other other items that uh, might be needed. But uh, I, I agree with the four million, but I think we need, personally, I say do it in two out of the first disbursement we get and two out of the second. Because we're getting eight point eight, yeah, we've used one hundred fifty six thousand so far, or the roundabout. So, to a lot for something that comes up in the next eight months before the next money yeah. comes in. Just my thought. Any other comments or questions? Okay, we've had a motion and a second now. The motion is four. Is that out of the total? No, the motion stands. Four million out of the, the current four point four. Because we are we are ahead on our sales tax revenue through June eight hundred thousand dollars. We don't have anything for the current year though. We won't for a couple of months. I would recommend allowing staff to Maybe present some options on holding back some of the funds uh, for COVID response uh, based on Mr. Keller's information and some of the other things that we may be looking at. Uh, it, it might tie our hands a little bit at that level. Under the original motion. You got, well, I'll just state that you got the rest of the revenue coming in eight months or less. And if you start spending any money on water, it's going to take uh, engineering and a lot before you ever expend a dime of that. So, yeah. but that's where I'm at. Well, that's that's 
that's my point in saying let's not do it all at one time let's do it in, in two separate minutes in order to bring up some of that makes sense what he's saying I'll withdraw let me let me withdraw the motion and I'll go three million dollars uh, that'd be my motion if I get a second I do if I don't I understand then I'm, I'm three million off of the first 4.4 .4. Mm -hmm. I'll second that motion yeah. got a motion and second on that any other discussion is there I, I just have to know I'm sorry if there's a need other than water that's identified for Cody. Is there an opportunity to come back and say, look, this this need we didn't know about September 13th. Since we don't have the uh, the cost for the water. You've got that right at any time in any meeting to state there's been a change. So that that is <laughs> always up, standard. So you can do that. Okay. That that is always but I your understand problem. what you're saying, just for planning purposes, set that yeah. aside. Well, it gets back to what Patrick was saying earlier. If we don't plan things out, I, you know, I get it, and I, I'm gonna be responsive. But we've got to start. We've got to plan it and and have some forward thinking moving forward on uh, timelines and dollar amounts. So, uh, but there, you have to, you do have that option to always come before our board, and if there's a true need, yeah, the board I, I apologize if um, uh, maybe not apologize, but uh, you know, some of the counties have put plans together and they've had like a, a Buncombe just did a, a plan I think a quarter plan uh, where they had it all kind of laid out and so we've looked at a template like that um, didn't have time to maybe get something in front of you yet but um, we'll take if depending on the outcome of the vote we'll take that and present something if the vote passes we're still got one over 1.2 plan and it's in in eight months uh, you know you got 1.2 million dollars for any right. unforeseen emergency and within an eight month period historically how many emergencies have we had over the last 20 years within a eight month period in the budget cycle that you needed 1.2 million dollars for of course we're in something different now with the pandemic i get you we're, this is something as, as william would say we never faced before i get that but you there is flexibility we, okay. The board is always responsive to needs. All right, we've had a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. I oppose, and I don't oppose the $4 million. I agree 100%. But I, I think it should be done in two intervals, in the two million at a time. And that's my only reason for opposing. I agree with the money, but I disagree with the way that we're doing it. Just to make that clear. You have okay. a resolution. Okay, so, yes, and item G, we've got a resolution. And I'd like to uh, ask Ms. Vaughn if she would to, uh, it's a resolution uh, declared September 2021 as the preparedness month for McDowell County. And I'd like to ask Ms. Commissioner Vaughn to read that, please. Whereas National Preparedness Month is an observance each September to raise awareness about the importance of preparing for disasters and emergencies that could happen at any time. And whereas McDowell County has been affected by a number of disasters in, and emergencies in recent years, including hurricanes Florence, Drain, Michael, and Tropical Storms Fred, as well as snow and ice storms, and whereas counties throughout North Carolina have been affected by a variety of emergencies, including mudslides, wildfires, flooding, earthquakes, and COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas in 2020, the state of North Carolina experienced 48 tornado touchdowns, 247 flood incidents, and 609 severe thunderstorms with damaging wind and hail, all of which resulted in more than 27.5 million in damages statewide. And whereas the peak period of hurricane season is historically mid-August through October and September 10th marks the peak of hurricane <coughs> season. And whereas on Saturday, August the 14th, 2021, Brunswick County Commissioner and NC Association President, am I wrong? President Frank Williams announced the 100 Counties Prepared Initiative 
and whereas the 100 counties prepared initiative will focus on training com county commissioners on how to effectively leave during emergencies compiling resources to assist commissioners during emergency situations and helping commissioners establish relationships with key emergency management partners and whereas the 2021 theme of national preparedness month is prepared to protect preparing for disasters to protect everyone you love and whereas national preparedness month is aimed at encouraging citizens to develop an emergency plan build an emergency kit and take other proactive steps to prepare for potential emergencies whereas the mcdowell county board of commissioners desires that every household property owner and business in mcdowell county be prepared for potential emergencies now therefore be it proclaimed the mcdowell county board of commissioners hereby declares september 2021 as preparedness month in mcdowell county and encourages all citizens to protect, prepare to protect their loved ones by developing an emergency plan, building an emergency kit, and communicating their emergency plan to all members of their household and or workplace. Adopted this 13th day of September, 2021. Okay, well, it's a pleasure of the board that we adopt this resolution. Mr. Chair, make a motion to approve the resolution declaring September 2021 as preparedness month in McDowell County. Got a motion. Second. Second. In discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Okay, that takes care of all of those items. Now we're at citizen comments. Is there any citizens here tonight that wish to speak? Please sign up and uh, we will allow you three minutes. Mr. Staff reports. Just uh, mention that next month's meeting will be at the Carson House. Uh, Mr. Prebor did mention the housing repair program. Uh, for that reason, and also the uh, workforce housing project, Mr. Gurney from Gateway Wellness will be at the meeting to talk about housing. So, okay. I'm sure I have other things. I believe that means at 4 o'clock. Yes, sir. Uh, man. <laughs> <laughs> a long night. Do I hear a motion? We do. So moved. Got a motion, second. All in favor say aye. Thank you for coming. We are adjourned.